Good evening. Welcome to worship as we gather during these, these midweek Lenten services to worship and to pray. And this year we're doing a deep dive into the Apostles' Creed. So welcome as we uh, continue to do that today. My hope is that by the end of this series, when you hear the Apostles' Creed in worship, it won't be quite so rote. and It'll sing to you a little more as these phrases uh, jump out at you and you make some associations with some of the things that you've uh, learned and heard. So welcome as we continue this. I invite you to stand as you're able as we begin with a call to worship. We gather as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Mercy, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God Almighty, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us, we pray, to be grounded and settled in your truth by the coming of the Holy Spirit into our hearts. That which we know not, reveal. That which is wanting in us, Fill up that which we know, confirm, and keep us blameless in your service through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let us confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. 
The Apostles' Creed is split into three different articles or or sections, and tonight we're going to be dealing with the second article, but the first part of it. So, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Got a couple of scriptures to share with you as we get into this part of the Creed, beginning, beginning with a reading from Galatians 4. Paul writes, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of the Lord. And a reading from Hebrews, also chapter 4. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You might not have realized it, but we get a little bit of Christmas every Sunday when we say the Creed. The first part of the second article of the Apostles' Creed is rich with all kinds of important theological statements. We explored a lot of this in the Sunday class last Sunday. We talked there about the name of Jesus and the title of Christ, which means Messiah. It's not his last name. His middle initial is not H. It should be the Jesus, the Christ. Christ is a title, not a surname. We talked about the uniqueness of Jesus as God's only Son, and what it means that he is our Lord. What I'd like to focus on tonight is simply the fact that Jesus was born. The Creed reminds us week after week that Jesus was born into this world. He didn't come down in a pod like Superman, he didn't materialize as a fully formed adult like the Terminator. He didn't teleport to earth from another realm like Dr. Strange. Jesus was born. He was born into this world. I think it's good for us to consider the significance of Jesus being born because unfortunately when we do it in December, it is surrounded by all the other trappings of the winter festival that has grown up all around it, the presents and the food and the decorations and all the rest. And don't get me wrong, I love all of that stuff. But I'm afraid that sometimes in the distraction of it all, the significance of Jesus being born sometimes gets lost. We miss the big picture. We miss the forest for the Christmas trees. Thank you. I'm really proud of that line. It's <laughs> we, yeah, thanks. <laughs> we miss what, it was all, what it's all about. So the creed reminds us of two important things about Jesus' birth. First, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. This baby did not come about in the regular human way. He was born to a virgin. When Mary asked how this was possible, the angel Gabriel told her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. The conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit and his birth to a virgin points to Jesus' divinity. God was coming into the world through this baby. Second, though, the creed reminds us that Jesus was born to Mary, a normal human being. Jesus had a human mother to whom he was born in that utterly human way we are all born. God experienced then life from the very beginning, 
from being carried in Mary's womb to opening his eyes for the first time to nursing at his mother's breast. God felt what it was like to be cold, to be hungry, to be in danger. God coughed and sneezed and filled his diapers. The Apostles' Creed reminds us then of the two natures of Christ, that he's both fully divine and fully human. And the readings I shared with you help us understand what this all means for us. The Galatians reading I shared is often referred to as Christmas according to St. Paul. The apostle tells us that God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. Jesus, Paul points out, was born of a woman. The pre-existent Son of God became fully human. He was born just like we are. He is then one of us. Jesus was also born under the law, Paul points out. That is to say, he was born into our situation. He was born under our obligation to keep the law of God, to abide by God's will. Remember, the adult Jesus said that he had not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus was born then to keep the law for us, for us who can never manage to do it ourselves. In doing so, Paul says, he has redeemed us who had been stuck under the condemnation of the law. Jesus' humanity and his divinity are both important. I know this is getting super theological. Just bear with me for a bit longer. His two natures contribute to our salvation in his humanity. Jesus is able to represent us on the stand, standing in for us, as it were, as the accused. And uh, he was born under the law for us and with us. And it is in his divinity that he is then able to have the power and authority to apply his not guilty status to all of us. The result of this, Paul says, is that we receive adoption as children of God. We go from being under the burden of the law to being under the care of an Abba, a father. We go from being a slave to the law to being a beloved child. We go from being condemned to being heirs. Or better word, from my perspective, I think a better translation there is beneficiaries. We become beneficiaries of forgiveness and life and salvation. The author of Hebrews says something very similar, coming at it from a different angle. In Hebrews 4, Jesus is described as a great high priest who can sympathize with us. He has been tempted or tested in every way that we have been. He has experienced the full range of the human condition. The adult Jesus knew what it was to be tired and to be thirsty. He knew what it was to weep and to be under great stress, and to be afraid. He knew what it was like to bleed and to die. And because of this, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness, confident that we will receive mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. We don't need to be afraid to bring our troubles to him, We shouldn't hesitate. We shouldn't be timid about it. We can come with boldness, with with confidence, for Jesus lived as one of us. He understands, and he can help. There's something very powerful about seeking out the company of those who have shared a common experience. Combat veterans suffering from PTSD often benefit from talking about other uh, people who've been in similar situations. There is a sad but special fraternity of those who have lost children. Only someone else who has shared that experience can really understand that pain. Recovering addicts find immense support and strength in fellowship with other recovering addicts, which is why I'm so proud that our congregation hosts three different addiction recovery groups in our walls, within our walls. 
What makes these and other similar kinds of associations and gatherings and fellowships so powerful is the concept of sympathy. If you break down the Greek roots of this word, sympathy literally means shared suffering. The sim prefix means with or together, and the Greek word pathos means suffering or emotion. Sympathy, then, is the shared experience of something, usually something difficult. What this passage from Hebrews is telling us is that Jesus shared our experience of the human condition. He has shared our struggles, our suffering. And because he has this same pathos, this this sympathy, we can boldly go to him. I remember cleaning out my mother's apartment just a few days after she died. I was all business, just trying to get things done. It wasn't, as far as I was concerned, it wasn't time to to grieve. It was a time to just get this stuff cleared out. All the clothes, all the paperwork, all the kitchen stuff. I was just there, all business. And I was there with my sister and with my godmother, who was my mother's best friend. And I managed to keep things together, get stuff done. Until, until my sister came out of my mom's bedroom with an armful of scarves, many of which were gifts from me, uh, something both my wife and my mom had in common is they loved to wear scarves. So it was a common present. Amy had helped me pick out something nice, something pretty, and we gave her a lot of scarves over the years. And as soon as my sister came out of the room with that armful of scarves, it was, it was the stupid scarves that got me. <laughs> And so I kind of melted and uh, melted down into this puddle of tears. And it was then that my godmother came up to me and she put her arms around me as I was sobbing at that point. And she just held me. She held me tight. And she said, I know, I know, I know. I'll never forget her saying those words, I know. Only she could have said those words to me because she did know. We were grieving over the same person. We had been through many of the same struggles and frustrations with my mom. She really did know. And her knowing made all the difference. This is sympathy. And in Hebrews, we learn that Jesus has sympathy for us. And so when we approach the throne of God, we are not going to the principal's office for a reckoning. As we approach the throne of God, we are not going before a judge who is about to pass sentence on us. As St. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we approach the throne of God, we know that we are not coming into the presence of a God who is so other, so divine, that there's no point of commonality, no sympathy. When we approach the throne of God, we are approaching the great high priest who has experienced our humanity, who has shared our suffering. We are approaching the great high priest who can sympathize with us. When we approach the throne of God, we find Jesus who holds us close, pulling us in tight, saying to us, I know, I know. And he does know. You don't have to find a Bible passage that fits exactly with your specific kind of suffering. On the cross, Jesus bore it all. So whatever it is, He knows. Because of this, we can approach the throne of grace with boldness, confident that we will receive mercy and find grace in every time of need. Whenever we approach the throne of God, we are approaching the one who was born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us who are under the law, that we might be adopted as God's children. We are approaching Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
And that, Charlie Brown, is what Christmas is all about. <laughs> Amen. We're going to commit a major uh, liturgical faux pas and sing a Christmas carol in the middle of Lent. Please stand as we sing. <clears throat> Let us pray. Jesus, you are the Christ, the anointed one, our Messiah, our Savior. We praise you for redeeming us from our bondage to sin and death. May your holy name be on our lips and in our hearts, that we would live in peace and hope in the midst of every trial, knowing that your saving love is ever near. Jesus, you are God's only Son, sharing a unique relationship and oneness with God the Father. We praise you for making it possible for us to be adopted into this same relationship, that with you we would call God our Abba, our Father. Empower us to live in joyful obedience to our Father's will, 
and confidence to approach the throne of grace whenever we fail. Jesus, you are our Lord. You are our highest authority and our greatest good. You are our God. We praise you for revealing yourself to us as the word which became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. Teach us to cling to this grace and live by this truth. Jesus, you were conceived by the Holy Spirit, and so you are holy, the Son of God. We praise you for your divinity, for your power, for your glory. We praise you for using your power to give us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Jesus, you were born of a woman, born of the Virgin Mary. We praise you for coming into the world as a baby, that you might share our humanity in its entirety. Teach us that we can always turn to you with every human problem or struggle, trial or temptation, for you have sympathy for us. Hold us close as we await the new day you have promised, when every last vestige of sin is gone, and sin and death and mourning and crying and pain will be no more. pray using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. You may be seated for the sending hymn.
at the end of the day. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We do invite you now to join us next door in the fellowship hall for a soup supper. Uh, I regret that I will not be joining you. My youngest son has a band concert across the street at the high school starting in about 25 minutes. So I'm going to dash. But I hope that you'll stay and eat. There's always great soup here. I'm going to miss it tonight. Um, But whether you're eating here or elsewhere, uh, we can thank God for it nonetheless. Also, just a reminder that um, our special offering for the meal throughout the season of Lent goes to the ELCA World Hunger Appeal. That's our ministry of the month um, for March, and it's our special offering for midweek services during the season of Lent. Let us pray together, giving thanks to God for God's gifts. Heavenly Father, we notice the creation around us starting to spring to life. We see the good things coming forth from the earth as bulbs are sprouting up. Uh, It's still a bummer to have to scrape the windshield, but we know that spring is on the way, and with it, many, many good gifts uh, from you. You continue to call forth from the earth good things for us to eat, for us to enjoy, and to be strengthened by. We thank you for those good gifts tonight. Uh, We thank you for the fellowship that we enjoy tonight. So bless the food and bless our time together that we will be strengthened for your service. And we do indeed also call to mind those who don't have enough. Work through us to give them a share in the abundance of your creation. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to serve the Lord.